Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Being an elephant. I'm going to give this background real fast. My name is Joe Scarpetta. I'm the owner of the Scarpetta Group. We're based out of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Platinum partner since 2013. I've been using FileMaker since like 2.1 at 96. Just for just for a little fun, those are uh, my wife and our dogs. I did teach that's Lady Baby. I did teach the dog how to smile <laughs> and for a good laugh. Uh, my little brown one is three pounds is Princess Leia. We have Lady Baby, and the top one is Post is Twinkie. So <laughs> a little fun stuff there. All right, so I'm really here to kind of tell you a story today of the journey we went through adding a second product to our SBA and, and all of this. There's, a lot of learning curve because we you know, even though we've already had a vertical, you add a vertical and put a partner into the mix of this, it's, it becomes way more interesting, um, especially when they're not a developer and they don't have a developer mindset. So it really taught us a whole new way to look at how to manage all this. So these are the topics we're going to cover. We're going to talk about hosting, team, table etiquette because we are eating an elephant, um, setting price, and maintaining sanity. So I already heard the answer, but what? You know, how to eat an elephant? One bite at a time. One bite at a time, right? And we felt like we bit off the whole backside at one point. So <laughs> don't want to do that. And that's what I want to help you guys with. Um, all right. So we have two products. Um, we've had Jarvis CRM. You may have heard this in the community. At one point, we used to sell it as a template to developers and then COVID. So we we took it and then upgraded it significantly during COVID because as, as most of us, we had entertainment and we had event type people. We had a bunch of clients drop off. So it was a great time to expand the product. We put it in the SBA at that point. We've kept a decent install base. It's a pretty significant investment. It's general business, CRM, ERP. And then we built a project in between for a customer for quality buildings in Oklahoma. And what we did is we took Jarvis, we modified it for the shed industry. And in that process, the the owner was, the goal was to set it up so that he was going to sell his company. It was to make it as nice as possible so that it was like the piece that would just win over that person that wanted to buy the company. And the company sold in 2021 um, really quick. And we got involved with this new company that owned uh, this other shed manufacturing. Matt, Matt Blake and I have now partnered on this. So now we've taken it whole new level. In the last 18 months, we've done about 6,000 hours of development in this. Um, he's put well over a million dollars into it. And we've, so we've customized it so it does everything for the portable building industry. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today is how we got there. I'm not here to sell these products. I'm here to just tell you the story behind them. Go from there. Um, anytime if you have questions, just raise your hand, ask questions. I'm happy to you know, have this more as a conversation. So... Who in here has a product? Who's thinking about having a product? Okay. All right. Why do you want to do it? Why do you want to have a product? Oh, yes. <laughs> Money, right? <laughs> but but what problems are you trying to solve with the product? <laughs> so if I understand an industry at a higher level, I have my current clients. Um, now I want to produce something similar to that, but for an entry level type. Get it started, things yes. like that. Okay. So that's one of the things, you know, so what, you know, make sure that there's happy or wise answer. I did too much with Tony Robbins, so it might start to spill out with <laughs> stuff. Um, but, you know, make sure you have your why, and you've got a purpose behind it, and you have a vision as to, as to where you're going to go with it, and you're truly trying to solve a problem. So... So licensing. So in order to get into the SBA license, aren't everybody familiar with the SBA in here? I know a huge chunk of you are. All right, so let's let's talk about that for a minute. So the SBA is the Solution Bundle Agreement, not Small Business Administration. It's the <laughs> Solution Bundle Agreement. And what it does is as developers who have gone through the process of Claire, so the first step is you have to be a Claire's partner. So you have to go through all the steps with that. You need references. You pay them, I think, $500 a year for your office location, you get listed on the site, they vet you a little bit, and then, then you go through and then 
you can get into the SBA, but you have to be in business for a year under your company to become a partner. And there's different levels. There's platinum. You get invited to platinum and do certain things and when they feel you're ready. Um, once you've gone through that, then you can take your product and you can submit it to Claris and they go through and they vet your product. Um, one of the first things you'll catch if you've got an oil solution is if you have the classic theme in your product, they're going to kick it back to you immediately. <laughs> that always rears its head when you do a little dash between your layouts. Um, so you some things there. But what it really lets you do are two major things. So you've got discounted bundling. So instead of paying your normal FileMaker pricing, you get the discounted bundle prices, which then lets you re let you resell this as your product, but you're not selling the licensing. You are the owner of the license. You're responsible. You know, if a client moves on, you're responsible to make sure they uninstall. You're held accountable for that. You're accountable for keeping track of everyone who has a license. of Claire's audit you and says, you know, where are these? But it also helps you save some money. So the standard licensing model, one server, one client. The SBA, because you own the licenses, you know, have multi-tenant on your servers. <clears throat> Any questions there? When multi-tenant can be used a couple of ways, could you explain specifically what you mean by that? The multi-tenant, so if I've got, with my Jarvis instance, uh, I could have however many clients that I want to put on that single server that, you know, for performance and things like that. So I can scale that how I choose, but I'm allowed to do that under standard FileMaker license that you're not allowed to do that. It's one client per server. Okay, single sign, single server, but multiple uh, multiple files. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Tyler left because he could answer a ton more questions about the SBA. But um, that's that. And also get you your listing on the site, things like that for, for that. <laughs> So somebody tells me quickly, we don't, what does it take to get a product to market? Is it a simple as just lack of sleep? That's one of them. Um, you know, it's as simple as building a website and selling it, um, telling people about it, anything else. So it's, you know, with, Jarvis it's a little easier because it's just it was just focused. It was, you know, here it is, do some tweaks, and then, and then off you go. You get into this shed product. You're, you're talking about a solution with 1,500 layouts. Um, I couldn't even tell you how many thousands of scripts. And, you know, I think we're at 280 data tables today, and I lost track of the API connections at this point in time. So that's just the development part of it. So there's, there's all these pieces, and there's things that, you know, when you're scaling and trying to build development and you're trying to get it to market, you're trying to figure, there's things you just don't even pay attention to because Jarvis was different. There's all we had this and then we kind of just went to smaller groups. Let's talk about the, you know, the plan in general. So, some of you guys are familiar, I know, can I, can I call you out here? <laughs> sure, yeah. You know, he's had a product for years and um, so he's familiar with a lot of this, um, and it's 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 a lot more complicated. But I've got that partner part of this where you know Matt didn't understand the development process, so we've had to educate partner all the way through this. It was not just not just paying the developers to make this happen; it's assembling the team and putting all these pieces together. So you know, you've got the when. So as you as you're building your product. You know, when do you want to go to market with it? Is it ready? Have you checked out your competition? You know, so as we went through with Shedverse, we started looking at our competition. There's only really three other players in the space. And everybody does kind of fit into one of their categories. But what we found is that our abilities with FileMaker far surpassed the abilities of, of these other customers because we could do things live. You know, we've got an agreement with, with the company in Oklahoma. He'll never lose a sale. He has never lost a sale. We've always had somebody in front of it. <coughs> when something weird with data or data imports happened. Some, don't rear their head until later on. We've got somebody live that can go in and jump in and fix that data for them. Make that happen. But we're looking, you know, we've analyzed all the competition. We know what their pricing is. We understood their pricing structures. They have an interesting thing in the shed industry where they don't sell it by, you know, it's this amount per license. 
They sell it based on how much money do you make. So if you're making $100 million a year, you pay more than the guy who's making a million dollars a year. You're paying significantly more. So we decided that was a terrible model because we don't That's care about, we don't want to get into people's profits. That's almost everything. Yeah. <laughs> We want to just get in. We want a fair price for, for the market. Um, we got to look at, you know, what are we releasing? Because, you know, we all want to build the whole thing and have this, this beautiful polished product and this waterfall type development process and have that out there. But there's not, a, there's never enough time. And when you're building something of this scale, it's, you know, there's just so many parts and moving pieces to that. So what do you put in it? And so my vision of what was going in this was way different than Matt's vision of what was going in this to get this to market. <clears throat> so so you've got, you know, add that layer and it's finding that, that halfway point. So it's like, do we have the leasing module built in now? Do we build the leasing module? We tell everybody and then we put that out as a beta. That's where we ended up. Um, you know, do we, are we integrating QuickBooks right now? Do we, are we going to do other things later? Like that. You know, and then there's planning the future releases. You know, and as we've onboarded customers, you know, how do you migrate? When do you migrate? You know, explaining migration to a customer is way different than when you build something and you customize it. It's unique to that person. Just making little tweaks now live most of the time, unless it's too big of a system. And you've got your team to consider. Uh, I don't know about everybody in here, but it's real hard to find developers these days. And it's real hard to find the skill sets that you need. So when you grab somebody, you grab them and you hang on to them for dear life. We don't know what it takes. You're nodding because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Joe? If I could, developers have not been our problem. Our problem has been to find support people to be behind the developers because we have a very industry-specific solution. And we need people who not only understand the FileMaker side, but who understand the industry so they can be our trainers and our interface between development and the user. Those people are crazy hard to find. So that, that brings an interesting point. When you're looking for that, is you know, you've got the support people on all that. So your initial support with this become the developers because they now know this new industry. I know more about backyard sheds and that manufacturing process than I would ever want. <laughs> And I've been to three shed expos at this point in time, so it's even more interesting. Um, so, you know, so, you know, what roles do you need to set up for your company? Who's going to do what and set up that hierarchy? You know, I'm trying to you know, explain this in such a way as to think about all that stuff in advance before you get to that, that stage of, oh, I built the website to sell the product. Because then you get to that stage and it's like, oh, crap. Now, you know, now how do we fill that role? Because you didn't realize you needed it at the beginning because you're so focused on the development that tunnel vision. You know, what skill sets do you need for your team? Do they need to be employees? Do they need to be contractors? So we've, done, we've done the hybrid with that. So it's like sometimes I need somebody who's super strong in JavaScript. Um, sometimes I need somebody super strong in interface and then APIs. And then sometimes, sometimes you're bottlenecked just by, you know, your brother's overloaded with work right now and he's trying to find his balance and, and distribute what he's got got employees versus contractors, and then you get the government stepping in saying, we're going to evaluate your con what contractors look like over 2024, 2025 now. You, got, you figure that out. As soon as you make employees, now you got payroll to meet. So are you selling it, or are you, where, where are you at in the pipeline? The um, sales and marketing, so those are plans that you'll need to put together as well. How are you going to put this out there? Are you selling to developers? Are you selling to Sell to a niche market. How right, do you get that? Where are you going to place that out there? And, you know, today now it's all social media. If you're not some type of, you know, if you find an influencer and have them, you know, help pitch your products and put them on and pay them for their, well, I'm going to use this and make a big deal out of it. Uh, we've done trade shows. You know, we used to come here with Jarvis and that. Uh, now we're going to um, Shed Expos all over the country or here and there. Or do you put in a dedicated salesperson? And you got to build up that whole sales lead pipeline. So you get all these leads from the trade shows, follow-ups and things like that. And, and I know just even as a filmmaker company, we've dropped the ball on leads. So how do you put processes in place? 
make sure you don't drop the ball. And lastly, on this one, um, pricing. We kind of talked, touched on that already. You know, where do you want to fit on pricing? What's profitable? You know, what are your costs? If you figured out your costs, because you've got you've got your development, you've got your you've got all the IP that you put into this, you've got your hosting, you've got all the external services that you're paying for in your salary. So, what's the right price point based on your cost, so that you can recoup your investment over time? The second half of this gets more interesting. So now you've built this monster and you get your first customer. So I spent probably three weeks over the three weeks with this customer when we first onboarded the first one. And it wasn't all at one time, it was scattered. I go up like two or three days at a time. I drive from you know South Carolina to uh, Greenville, South Carolina to Burlington, North Carolina with them. And great people. So that makes a big difference. You want to make sure you like the customer you're selling to, because especially with something as big as a shed product, you're making a commitment to them, you know, as far as the software and, and the personal commitment, making sure they understand it. Now they they initially, when they came on board, they just invested probably a quarter million dollars with NetSuite, and it was a total failure. Hmm. So we have to make sure that we've taken up service to a whole new level because they that's what never understood their needs. And as you know, so we're onboarding, I was making live changes to the dev file because their business process was slightly different, but it was more of an industry standard than where we were. We had a lot of little development tweaks with the first big customer. We're okay with that. We knew that was going to happen. But the onboarding, so they have to, have to make sure that business, that in those cases, you've really got to hold their hand. I got to get their data in. So what's their data in? Hopefully it's not written down on a piece of paper. I'm <laughs> glad it wasn't in their case. You know, they did have Excel sheets. I gave them information. They built some Excel sheets for us because the data in NetSuite was useless that they had. Um, we started to import their data and pull all those things together. And then I train them. We go back, we make some tweaks and we go back and forth. We did that for a period of about, you know, like a month or two over time. We got them on board, but the first day I was there, I knew enough about them. I knew enough about their data. I was able to show them how to create a quote for a shed that day. So that was that was one of the best parts of that. They kind of made that final win with that. Um, you know, support tools and processes. Um, you, know, you got to deal with special features um, that you put in place, the bugs. Um, but you've got to have something in place. So when you get 35 new users into a system and you're supporting the other system, things are definitely going to come up when you get them onboarded. The majority of the issues that we have were training. So you know, we train the major people in the company, the, the, the executive team, so they can go train all of the individual um, dealers and people with the different lots so that they could go through, sell the product, move on. Well, everybody has a different level of training and everybody has a different level of how they remember what you trained them. So needless to say, you know, day one, when they really went live, we were inundated with support. Because got things, they changed things, they didn't, shouldn't have touched and things like that. We protected things like that, but one of the managers decided, I'm going to go in and make these little tweaks. Um, you should have done that. So that, that's my question. They had access, like you gave full no, you're them. not allowed. So that's another piece with the SBA. The, the customer can never have full access okay. to the, the file ever. They can't edit things. They can't. It's data. So what did they go in and change? We have a settings module, and somebody okay. went in and made some changes in the settings. They they misunderstood something. So they changed some access settings. So we had to do more education. So what what came out of support is what Beth uh, Muriel did for me. Um, she was the one responsible for this. As far as the training and the support, is she built a process with Freshdesk, Slack, and Claris Connect. So you go up, hit a menu in FileMaker, and fill in a little form and hit submit. And it would, depending upon what you selected, you go create a Freshdesk ticket and it'd come back through Claris Connect. It'd send emails out and post it in Slack and on 911 or a different priority channel so that the whole team would see that there's a ticket and then somebody jump on and manage the ticket. On top of that, then we started to go through and we built out videos. Here's how to do these processes and put that all into fresh text. Now, hindsight, I would have gone and done all that ahead of time as opposed to this 
fire drill of trying to manage that. Um, now we're at a state, you know, after three, four months ago, now we get two tickets a week. We added in another, another thing to minimize the support we went to is Beth's idea again. We went to what we call office hours for that, for the product. She saw that with a few other companies that are doing that. It's like, well, that might work with the customers. So do that in, and that minimizes because they can come in as a group and somebody asks got a question and answer, and answer somebody else's question. So it was really great, great piece to go in there as well. You can feature request. So a lot of the, another big chunk of what started coming in through there was like, we need to be able to do, and well, we're not ready to do that yet, or, you know, we have never thought of that, or we didn't know someone in the industry did that. So how do you manage, so you had to manage that, because then that's not just something they get, you know, is it something custom that they want? We're not going to customize by person in this industry. We'll build something, we might pull the toggle, turn it on and off, so if the customer wants to use it or not. But how do you manage that? Because it's going to cost time and money. And then are we going to build it in a way that it's going to fit the industry? So that was the other thing. So we got to take that offline. We need to discuss it as a team. We need to discuss it with the shed builders that we work with, make sure that we can put this in in such a way that it makes sense for the long haul. And then it's really something is it should it, should it even end up in the product? Any questions? I guess further consideration is do you charge the client for <coughs> adding those features? So that was one of the things. If you want it now, then you can sponsor the feature. Then we'll, we'll bump it up the pipeline. So that's how we're starting to work with it in that respect. And then everybody gets it, but you sponsored it, so we'll jump it up the pipeline. We actually have a third layer on that. That's exactly how we do it. If they need it now, they can sponsor it, but everybody's going to get it. Or if it's something that's valuable, but they don't want to pay for it, it goes into backlog. Or if it's something that's so unique to them, but they swear they have to have it, then they can buy it. And that'll be custom to them because it's FileMaker and we can. Right. So we won't do the third option where they can buy it and get into it that way. Um, Again, we want to be able to push the updates. So that's what we're, we're trying to stay with that. You know, and then you've still got you know new players versions. So majority of these run best with desktop. We're not trying to build a web direct on that. Not that it's not a viable solution, but there's a lot more power with the desktop. And now we're seeing that with, with all this LLM and all the AI coming. I want to use the desktop so we can take full advantage of the local processing power. So instead of sitting in there and typing in a quote, saying new, and then typing the customer name, I can eventually sit there, maybe talk to Surrey through the microphone, say new quote, Joe Scarpetta, building size 8 by 12, go. And now all of a sudden it populates a quote, pulls all that data in using all the, the, this new technology. So that's where we want to try to get to. But now we've got to get new FileMaker versions out to the customer so that we can support that. So the minor releases are easy. They see the little notification, they get their update, they click, they note it. Click the button after we send them notification to say, yes, this version's okay. We, we've already tested it. Um, but then when we go to a new major release, you know, we need to roll those out. So because we're on the server end, you know, we're gaining performance. We're also gaining security. So we want to keep the servers moving along. But then you also have a consideration that some of these companies are way behind in technology. So you can only go so far with their versions. You have to be mindful of how you balance all of those pieces as well. I've got a client that's stuck in 196 till they upgrades like 25 computers, which is very expensive. You let it go too long. You know, and then it's, the, you know, the training. You know, do you download the file? How do you install the files? You know, do you have to go through and is that big part of a support package where you help them do that? Because these are, are non-technical people. These are people that are very good at sales. They're very good at building, but they're not very good at computers got to make sure that you're, you're hitting that right that right balance and that nurturing them in a proper way. Uh, and then there's the meetings with everything. You know, we do a quick meeting every morning, 9 o'clock, 15, 20 minutes. Here's the tickets. Here's the, the things that have come in that we need to work on. I need help with this. Uh, how do I do that? Can somebody else take this? cover those things every morning, 15, 20 minutes, so no one's stuck. So that way we can work throughout the day. Now we're all on Slack throughout the day. We can ping each other, ask questions. But we want to make sure we're doing those things proactively so that 
we know where things are and, and that they're moving along so that way no one's stuck and the ticket doesn't sit any longer than it needs to. Briefly, we'll meet with the whole team. So we build it out in release cycle. So it's like, a, here's these X features that are going to be in this next release that we're going to push out in two weeks. Here's the ones that are for the one after, and we're working like three out with that. And anybody can always go through and if they finish what they're supposed to, they could go through and pick one and, and bump it up, but it just has to be tested and pushed through the process. You gotta, those are all major considerations in, in all of this. Questions? Feel familiar to anyone? Yes. Have you any recommendations as far as not necessarily uh, tools that you've custom built, but tools that are out there that help you with any of, any of these last six or seven things that you just That built. is definitely coming. I'll answer some of that. <laughs> Anything else? So one of the things that I was, Susan's not here. She's going to pop in. And, but one of the things that Susan found about from Beyond the Chaos did, she was working as a project manager. And I'm sure several of you know her because she's been in the community forever. She dragged me kicking and screaming into documenting the company. I have to do this. I know what we need to do. Everybody knows what we need to do. Well, I, I finally I finally went down the rabbit hole and we did all of it. And then I realized that no one was asking me questions anymore. So I was like, all right, this works really well. So I was like, all right, we did the right thing. Um, but document everything. So you have your processes. We use teamwork for that part of it. Um, we use teamwork for our project management, but we've got this whole document repository that we set up in there in the notes that all of our, everything's there. So there's no question about how do I, you know, what's the policy for time off of our workouts? What are our job descriptions, development standards, support processes? How do I onboard a customer? This is company and it's some Shedverse stuff, but these are the general things. How all of that maps out. That way you can kind of sit back and now that I can, back at that and say, I know I hated the process, but it was the best thing I ever did. Um, on the customer size, you know, you know, how you manage sales and marketing. So that's all mapped out. These are the things that we're going to do. We're going to put things here. We're going to send out posts on these days. We're going to do that. Interacting with the customers, you know, trying to get a new, you've got a new call in, we've got a new customer. You know, when they say certain things and you've got somewhat of a, a script or a way to respond to certain things, um, how do you react when the customer's not happy? Because we've all had an unhappy customer. If you, if you didn't, then you're not writing code. Um, you know, and then, like, what are support hours? My phone's not ringing at midnight. Um, you, know, you know, so what, you know, how do you balance all of that? So it's fair to the customer and it's fair to you. What are your response times? You put all that in there and then you publish the right parts of that back to your customer. Then nothing ever fits the way you planned. So that's one of the great things about putting it all in teamwork. We can put it in there. You can modify things. You've got the flexibility to change and make decisions. But for me as a business owner, I have to make a whole lot less decisions because it's already written down. No, this is what it is. And when it falls in that gray area, then the phone can ring. Question? No. Okay. That speaks a lot to setting expectations, both to your customers and your employees, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, everyone knows point. what to expect. Yes. I mean, that's, that's probably the biggest thing. So, like, even on the developments, you know, we're setting the expectations for this is when we have to have this. You're not going to make it. If there's something unforeseen, then we need to communicate that all the way through. And then with the customer, it's like, okay, this is the new feature release. This is what's coming. But then with the same with the support, so that we're communication and that's that's the most important part of that you got development standards then you know how do you want to what are you going to use for your development uh, we follow anchor buoy somebody in this room grilled it into my head about 20 years ago um, and I stuck with it but there, you know you could do the squid squids okay I see plenty of twisted squids don't use a twisted squid model that's the <coughs> Just as a mess, but we've seen, we've all seen those. Um, but then you've got Agile and Waterfall. So you probably initially this is a big waterfall project to get this thing out and get it to market. And then after that, the best thing you can do is get into that Agile process and 
then move that along. What, what do you guys use it for coding standards today? Anybody using anything else? Hope not. <laughs> but, you know, even going back to that, I mean, you can see the graph is really organized and things like that. That actually is a screenshot of the development file. There's a few pixels off on a few of those. I'll live with that. But everyone's working together. So there's a special way to name a table. There's a certain there's, there's the only way to name a table. There's the only way to name a field. There's the only way to put it on the graph. There'll be some descriptors to get added sometimes. Um, value list and scripts kind of get gray with how they get named these days, but as long as everybody can kind of get in there and do those parts, but the scripts, then it has to have a header part where it's commented. All the code has to be commented. If you've made a change or you're, you're taking something out, you don't get to delete it. You get to comment it out and put it note in there and the date that you did it so that we know or put a note in there destroy after so you know if it made it through the next 30 days and there were no problems we <coughs> that out the next time we see it but you know, choose some coding standards stick to them uh, on our website I was going to throw the link in here I forgot but I've got a 20 page document on, on how we do the coding standards that John so graciously taught me many many years ago that we still know and love and I've tweaked how it's done but <laughs> um, worked very well for us. Questions, comments? Consistency is the key word I've found to be most important. So naming could change, or that's it. It's uh, on custom projects, but consistency so that everyone knows what's going on uh, afterwards or can decode. Yes, but, but when you're doing following a standard like this thing, everything becomes predictable. Okay. So, and it, it becomes old hat, say, because you can just sit there, you're not thinking about standard anymore, you're just working, you're putting it together. It makes onboarding significantly faster when you bring a new developer in. So I can bring somebody in who's not worked in the file before and have them up and running within the same day. Here's here's a task that I want you to complete and give them some narrow focus because this thing's a beast. You don't want, not going to understand the business for, for a year. It's going to take a year to understand the business model. But if I can get them to understand the model of the task at hand, then we can flow that through and then they'll start to expand it and move on. Anything else? Funding. This is the fun part. You know, so building. Building something small is not that big a deal, but now we're talking in something that, you know, there's 6,000 hours in the last 18 months, but there was also um, two or 3,000 hours in from the previous client, and then how many thousands of hours that we had into Jarvis. So you're, you're looking at tons of hours that have been into this. So are you going to do, you don't want to do sweat equity of that because you'll be, you know, long, hard haul trying to get through with that. Um, you go out to get loans from the bank, don't necessarily want to go down that road. But if you know you're going to hit a market that you know that you're really going to hit a niche in and it's going to take off, that might be a viable option. You know, we had the unintended partner. Um, so the way that came about is, you know, we we're making changes and just tweaking the file. And I'm looking at this myself and, you know, for the last 20 years, I've had people come to me, we've got this best thing. If we build this together, and then, then you'll make your money back after it sells. And I would laugh and say, no. Um, <laughs> um, and so off you go and uh, go on. So this time around, I'm going through and I'm working on the file and I'm doing some coding and I'm like, this would be a great product for a niche industry. Huh. So on that a couple days later, after I thought about it a little more, hey, Matt, I was thinking this could be a product. Like, you know, I was thinking that too. Um, and, and then well, here we are. <laughs> um, and so you've got that. <laughs> and then, you know, the option, the other option is, you know, just build enough and then hope it sells and you can fund the next chunk of development. That's not the, that's not the best way to do it either. But if you want to put something out that, you know, people know and love and brand and you build that brand reputation. Um, but what is... 
when you're building something, when you're building a project, what are the two most overlooked pieces that the customer doesn't understand that cost time and money? Anybody tell me what they are? Two parts to that. that there's Anybody have an idea? Me is designing the new function. No. <laughs> Admin. Okay. Okay. Expand. Expand on that. Well, uh, I don't know, like uh, the paying the secretary, your your accounting, uh, okay. thing, everything that's not development and everything around what you're doing, paying your paying your employee as a as <laughs> the, 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 the work around that, and it's it's hard to to, to explain to the customer. Anyone else? I think meetings can be uh, <laughs> a big one. Yeah. That's, that's the one I was looking. So project management meetings. There are some people, anybody else have you know customers that are like, why do I have to pay for meetings? Why do I have to pay for a project manager? You guys have those issues. Um, so you know those are the two those are the two big pieces. And so in this, I, I think we've got close to seven or eight hundred hours that we've logged in meetings alone just to, to get to this point. But that's the most important part of the entire process because if you don't understand what the person wants in the first place, you can't build it correctly. And so we have a general rule we're doing it. Well, we might gather the requirements, but before we build it, let's go the day before we build it, let's go validate it with them one more time because they might have changed their mind somewhere in that process. Or there might be one more thing now, that's the one time you don't want one more thing. You want that at the end of the Apple key. You want that, that. Leave it there, not in your development process. And it gets very, that's the part that gets very expensive because you can't, you know, when you're building the product, that's really kind of your own time at that point. So you've got to consider all that in the funding, pushing that all through. Any other questions? I would add on funding development, uh, your customers pay for more development. As you as you get more and more customers and they ask for more and more things mm -hmm. and they pay for them, your product keeps getting better and better with every customer. That's true. And they're funding it. Yes. The development. To your question now, what tools? All right. So we manage our projects. We use Teamwork. It's worked out very well for us. Um, Licensing-wise, it makes a whole lot of sense for for the customers, as we or from or from our perspective, because we don't have to pay for a license for the customer. We make them a collaborator, so they can go in and see everything that's going on on the list. They can comment, and upload files, download files, and manage everything there. Calendly, so that we can time block and make sure that you know when we schedule meetings and pull things together, that we're falling in something that we can be efficient. So we do a lot of time blocking and say, okay, and I, I'm I'm the biggest one of that. It's like, okay, I'm coding from here to here. Monday's my Monday's my shed burst day. <laughs> this is all I'm doing here. Don't ask me a question about anything else. And Friday, Thursday, and Friday, I've got a little block for some admin things or for some other projects and things like that. Development tools are obvious. Uh, we all live in in the FileMaker realm. Uh, we use the Adobe Suite for some things, for um, some of the web stuff occasionally here and there. Outside of that, um, I think James will get into using Postman. There's some other little web tools. Curiosity, what do you use for like uh, for like to use like base elements or reception for keeping track of like all that? Putting that on here. Um, I use base elements. It's just kind of been my use it for years. So it's kind of been my niche. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll fall back and use FM perception here and there. Kind of a trade because I'm trying to find that field that I want to delete. You said not to delete your fields, but sometimes you're trying to do some things because there's legacy or somebody put something in and never used it. So you do want to try to get behind it. Um, so we use both of those by primarily living base elements. Support. So we used um, Freshdesk. Like I mentioned earlier, we built a process with Freshdesk, Claris Connect, 
email with SendGrid and um, Slack. So we've got that whole that whole thread so it's all managed and all the notifications are hitting everybody. And that's working across our team internally and then the team of the bridge dealership. That. So they're getting notifications for different types. And if it's training, it goes to them. So it takes off the development issues with us. And we've got some great tools and we're seeing some wonderful things. We're going to build a studio so you can <coughs> DIY your own little solution then there. Communication, we've settled on Slack and Zoom. If you're working during the day, you log in Slack, your, your light can be on and you could be a little coding message on there and we honor that. So it's, you know, like if somebody sits down coding for that time block, then you know, we might send them a message, but it's delayed for two hours or something like that. So we're trying to try to keep it so people can stay focused so that we can get our, get our work done, produce quality. Uh, Zoom for meetings, we record all of our meetings and store them so we can follow back up. So that way when we're taking that, that initial meeting and we take it back to the developer, we can follow from this time to this time is the details on that task. Uh, accounting, we're using QuickBooks Online. It's just, I've used it since before, probably ever should have. Um, so we're going back as far as it probably came about. Um, we're still using it today and it's worked well and it's worked well for the customers. It's just, you know, most of it's payment, invoice, customer, pay your vendor, and you're done. Because um, a lot of the reportings are built into the systems that we're building for the, for the you know, the day-to-day -day operations type stuff. We're not pushing inventory and things into there or getting into any of that. Questions, comments, thoughts, and other tools that you guys might be using? Um, we use a lot of uh, Asana is really good for project management, but we've recently moved to ClickUp, which is even better, I think. I started messing with ClickUp the other day, so I've got my own personal task list in there just to kind of test it out. It's got a lot of nice features. You can do mind mapping, Kanban boards. That, that was the two pieces. Of, that I... Custom dashboards, and things like that. Pen and paper. Yes. Yeah, I kid you not, but uh, when doing, you know, a description of new features, the interface, how it should be, pen and paper is actually a very nice tool because you don't uh, go around in how does this feature work in this piece of software and so on. So I actually find pen and paper really rewarding uh, to focus on, on the feature and how it should look, and then it's just a mock-up. Uh, you have more time to think it through. Instead of focus too much on, on I do that every <laughs> day. I'll put, I've got a little small notepad and I'll put in the three must and then I'll put in a couple of things that I would like to get done so I'm not getting in and out of apps. But yeah. it gives you that nothing's ever done with software development. So you've got to do that thing every once in a while. You just go plant a tree just as you know, you're done, you put the shovel away. It's like I finished something. Um, but that kind of helps get your, your mind in those processes. You finish something. John? I found it really useful to find two tools to pair, do process flow diagramming, uh, and each node, each block in a process flow diagram would would correspond to a written business requirements document. And I would use, I use Lucid and Microsoft Word. I'm wondering what you and other people might use for process flow diagramming and business um, requirements together. So we've done done Lucid in the past, we're doing more of the process flow. Um, I've used um, OmniGraffle. Good. I'll use that more often than Oxus yeah. Mobile. And most of the time, if somebody's building a process flow, it's it's myself or James. So we're, we're building that out so we can hand that off and document it. We've, for our support team, for six, for six uh, support team members, they were stumbling over each other within. Uh, we, so we deployed Groove HQ. It allowed us to have a nice, uh, collaborative inbox and that also includes a chat feature which was really easy just to drop into a solution and just a card so now you can just initiate a live chat right inside of inside of our application that's cool and I'm thinking of doing stuff like that with this all this new AI stuff where they can type in a question and get directions that we're, we're using, using uh, lucid for diagramming or feature diagramming Workflow and process flow. But then we also use Confluence for documents that support. Did you say that last one again, please? Confluence. Confluence. It's a Jira. 
Gyros. Okay. Within Gyro. And we use Gyro for the Agile stuff too. Okay. Microsoft Teams for our meetings. And there's also chat in there if we choose to use that by us. For those using Microsoft SharePoint, Visio is a really wonderful tool. 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 <laughs> And we use Ring Central, which is like Slack, but it, it has Zoom in it. You can do screen sharing, and you can also like that, yeah. do almost uh, all your communication. All our clients have a channel inside Ring Central, so they all our people on our team and all the people on their team. So I can just like have a dashboard and just go down and see all our clients and all the activity of all our team in each channel. And they, you can post screenshots. You can initiate a video meeting. It's like an amazing tool. So we're using it. We're using Slack kind of in that fashion. We we'll have a channel for each of the clients, and then the team that's assigned to that, so that they can see. You know, we get that activity in there. We got a nine one one channel, so if something blows up anywhere you post in there, um, and then we'll create occasionally. We'll create a new Slack group. So for the shed stuff, we have a whole different Slack workspace manage that whole group so that we don't have all the clients like you're woven into a big mess. How many in your company? Uh, Twelve. Yeah, that was really interesting. We use Ring Central as well, but we use Ring Central customer facing. We just keep the Slack internal so that we don't cross the streams. Right. Anyone else? Yeah, it's just but we are using Drawio for mockup and uh, Flow. Also, it's free. Anyone else? Any other tool suggestion? Uh, I think a tool you didn't spoke about is about uh, knowledge ma knowledge management, knowledge base for clients. So we are using Zendesk, which is the competitor of Freshdesk. And in Zendesk, we have the knowledge base we can push to our clients the user guide, the user manual, trainings, videos, and so on. I think it's very important if we want to scale that we don't do the supports one by one, but run the knowledge base and do it. Yeah, so Freshdesk has the knowledge base for us. Um, I failed to mention Google on here, so we use our Google company. Um, it? You also failed to mention you use Jarvis for sales, <laughs> but um, <laughs> well, is that too self-promoting? But um, uh, if you're not using Jarvis, HubSpot is also a good sales tool. Yes, it is. Yes. And how many clients do you have? Um, I think we have about 40 active clients right now, but all different varying stages. So, so 12, 12 employees take care of 40 clients. Yeah, some might need something here and there, some are on support, and then we've got five or six that are really big active projects at one time. And also, we could actually use another developer. You mentioned that you're using Claire Studio there. Yes. Is that for internal or for customer facing? Right now, it's mostly been internal, okay. uh, but now I think we're going to be able to see future wise what we're going to be able to do with some of that. So I'm really excited with those possible. It's not ready for I've been, SBA. I've been begging for some kind of, I want a vendor to be able to log in and see their purchase orders and then just interact and then get out where I don't have to pay for licensing for all of that or build a web interface. Looks like you guys decided to go on a deploying through FMP. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're deploying through FMP instead of WebDirect. Can you kind of talk about why you go one way or the other, pros and cons? So at the so it was a decision actually by the client and the initial client is that they wanted iPads at all of the dealerships because what we're doing is we're getting the signature. So we're cap we're using FileMaker Go and capturing the signature on that. Um, that was that was one of the main reasons. And the, the other it's the ability to just quick pick it up, take pictures. So if I'm a driver, we got a whole driver management component to this. Drivers go out, they got a map, and they've got a list of all their stuff. When they deliver it, they have to take pictures that they delivered it in one piece. If they can't pick it up or deliver it, then they need to take pictures of why they couldn't deliver it that day. So the iPad was the best to deploy in that case. All those things are built right into Go. And we got all the GPS tracking so that we know that, you know, where did they really drop this? So in case, because there's been cases where it was dropped at the wrong house. So they knew where to go get it and bring it back and things like that. 
And I just feel, I don't know, I think WebDirect's got a lot of great things behind it, but I think for some of these apps, I think there's a lot more power between Go and the desktop versions. Um, and like I said earlier, it's like, you know, with all the AI coming, you've got the local processor, I don't know how that's all going to play out in WebDirect yet. Yep. We're getting close to time here. So, so there's lots of resources out there. Um, players community, once you become a partner, you get your mm -hmm. website listing, product previews, so you can get in touch with them. They're talking about all of us getting into ETS, things like that. You get reseller pricing. Um, that's the link. Become a partner. Tyler's sitting in the back. He can definitely answer questions about SBA and becoming a partner. You want more details, you know, mentor. Um, you know, Beth was talking about, um, you know, join table, what FM, user groups. There's lots of, there's lots of resources to, you know, get you to where you need to be. Um, once you become a partner, there's a whole section right within the partner page talking about the SBA and all the documents and things that you know, explain all the details. Do you serve uh, Google Drive and Google Docs? On your own server, or you use? Uh... We're on AWS, AWS, and so we, and we we run in multiple server situations where we've got our development server and we have our client servers. Um, we adopted Auto not too long ago to, to do those do those transfers to make it make it more efficient, <laughs> and very well for us. All right, so the you know. A lot of work, and there's a lot to consider. So you know, that's I want to make sure that bring these things out to everybody. You know, just that elephant, that that little chunk at a time. You know, and then um, it's been hard. So I don't want to, you know, but at the end of all this, it's like I'm really excited because we've got this really cool product. There's been all this work put into it, and it's building traction now. So we've got this huge pipeline that we're starting to see on the shed side. So I'm, I'm really excited to see where that's going to go and how that plays out over the years. So yeah, so total years from your from your brainchild. Oh, I think it'd be a good product to 2021 till today. Mid 2021 till today. So now if we go back on Jarvis, Jarvis started back in 2013. So it was already built on a really solid base at that mm -hmm. point. I have a question. So earlier you were talking about your competitors and how they were pricing things. Like, well, I just want to charge like a, a fair price. What goes into that thought process? Like, what is a fair price? So we looked at the other customers and their pricing. Um, there were a couple that did charge by user licensing, um, and we did some cost analysis on you know what's the servers costing us, what's the filemaker license costing us. You know, so we, we figured out what the hard costs were on, on those parts. And then we looked at the investment and, and we, you know, where do we want to be, you know, in five years? So we're, we put some numbers to that and then we kind of just dipped a little bit above what some of the other pricing was because we offer so much more. But then we also broke out into some of the modules. Where, so if you want a whole driver dispatch module, you'll pay like another $150 a month company to have that module. So we didn't charge a whole lot, but it's just enough to get extra fee per month. I mean, it's like it's like any other pricing. At some level, there's a little bit of a dark main toss, but you kind of have that range of where you want to be. Did you look mostly at like what your costs were and then sort of added, like, added a markup on that? Versus, yeah. Do you ever like try to quantify what the value is that you're providing to Customer. We looked at that too, as far as you know, with the service level that we're trying to provide. Like I said, you know, we're we're providing that service of you'll never lose a sale. So there's a tremendous amount of support that goes into that, where you know that somebody's phone might ring on Saturday at two o'clock in the afternoon, and you might have to go quick fix some data because the customer data that you imported was off for that one building. So we're trying to consolidate some of that into there, and then we're putting some value added services like you can. It comes with a certain level of support, but if you want more support for these extra things, then you can buy an additional support package. Does that help? Okay. Joe, you've mentioned a couple of times now your support staff jumping in to fix a piece of bad customer data. Is that a standard 
Is that something that comes with your support package or is that an enhanced support package? We, we do that as well, but yeah. we've been including that because we're saving them from themselves. But <laughs> Right. We, so we just kind of include it, I think, to some level because, you know, sometimes we don't know that it's their data. We, it might be some other weird yeah, sometimes problem. Sometimes it might be or It might, you know, we just want to make sure that the sale's complete. So that's the service we're offering. And sometimes it might be we found some weird bug be, because of their data or we found some other weird thing or there's some other situation where – Maybe the tax jar, there was some interruption with hitting tax jar and coming back for the taxes. Um, didn't happen. So how do we go in and fix and you know, re-trigger those events and things like that? Because we don't want them to get into that. All right, you were first. We, so we also struggled with the support. You know, how much support do you actually provide that's included with the subscription, et cetera. A couple years ago, we rolled out this concept called earned support that comes in with how what kind of packages are, are turned on etc <coughs> we also keep track of the amount of time we're spending with the customers by putting meetings and the tasks that they're getting to work on they can actually see all this inside of the program and that's been a big boon so once they exceed that they know to, they know to start limiting the amount of support that they're re, that they're requesting but then we just start building for it and we just haven't had a problem it's been a, been a nice additional revenue stream we're working on some things like that. So we added this other package that you could do an add on, but then it, if you exceed, I think the 15 hours, whatever this in this other package, or there's some different levels yeah. of packages. I know Beth's worked on that to get it. Um, once you exceed it, then you fall into it somehow we'll be billing rate then for the rest of that. I was wondering, do you allow any customer specific customization or is it always like they have to wait for? They have to wait. They have to wait. We won't do any customers. Not on the shed side, on, on the Jarvis side. You know, it's got it. So with our with our pricing model, we tend to charge like a site license. We work with nonprofits, and so they're a little bit more uh, price sensitive and, and changes the pricing. And so they usually have like three year budget cycles based on grants that they get from government agencies. How are you dealing with when Claris makes changing to prices, like handing that on to your client? Because for us, it's just a direct munch right out of our our margin. So we're yeah. Trying to figure out how to kind of manage that. What's that? And often without warning. Yeah, and sometimes without warning. And so and then we get these complex pricing models and we're like, how do we interpret this stuff? So how are you dealing and with we're it? SBA. Yeah. We're SBA. I think I've only seen that your prices change once in the last several years. Twice. But uh, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll evaluate at that time when we know it's coming. Um, yeah. and we'll probably pass that on at some level. Do you write I mean you write that in your licensing or how do you let clients kind of like expect that? We're still pretty new to this market, so we're we're still making adjustments to make it fit within the market properly. I would add two things, <clears throat> all great information, pardon me, but I would advise people to get a legal representation during this process because in our case, we sold one of our products to the client, but it was a three-year process to do that. And I think establishing a good Legal representation early on the process will help you make good licensing decisions and good legal decisions. And you know, it's always easy to say about a lawyer, you never need one until you need one. You need one. Yeah. But it's really important, especially if you're just starting yeah. out. Yeah. You know, and then you've got Claris licensing over here, your licensing over here, and you want to make sure everything is we defined all of that. Yeah. And it's all yeah. been but it's good to have a lawyer to call yes. you know, yeah. the, other, the last thing I would say is I think as developers we don't focus on sales real well because we're not necessarily sales. If you can have the resources to hire a dedicated salesperson or say that's all they do and let them go, it's awesome. You know, and, and a lot of people don't want to put the resources into that because they don't think, you know, I can sell my product or it sells itself. But having really good qualified salespeople is a key. Yes. What's that? I've got one more slide. And this is probably the most important part of all of this. <laughs> I blame Susan. I'm gonna call her out and blame her. So um, we, we all push it to the limit more often than not and we'll almost push it to where we fully burn out so remember when you're going through all this that taking care of yourself is probably more important than sometimes than hitting that deadline because we've pushed it so hard that to ask for one more day or one more month that you need that so I blame Susan that I took my wife to the Maldives for three weeks two uh -huh. years ago um, and when Three I leave, years ago? <laughs> well, 
Well, this is about three years ago. We're due for another one. <laughs> Done others since then, just a not year and a half ago. I've had other little things. <laughs> but the documentation and the processing and all of that was so important that when I went, my Google password gets changed. I have access to nothing. <laughs> so, and, and my, and, you know, my rule is there's nothing that can't be solved when I return. Find a way. Now, after this, if you want to continue these conversations. Um, I got all hyped up after five days. Tony Robbins business mastery about a year and a half ago. I forget if I called Susan or Brandon first and said, there's no Claris in person event. What are we doing? No, I want to do this. Let's do this. You guys come partner with me. I'm going to do it myself. So we've partnered and we're doing build, grow, learn. So it's part of the next step with the, the Claris. Um, we've got a full Full two day, three days of sessions. You got Jeremy Brown doing JavaScript one day, um, training. You've got the next two days, just a whole file maker track, but for you guys in the business and stuff like that, just business tracks running all day that Susan and Brandon have laid out. You know, leadership, HR, taxes, insurance, marketing. So that's all laid out. John speaking at events. Um, Where's John that? Norman, Molly Connolly, Andy Lacates is doing. No, so, but it's a player sponsored event. So I'm going to talk. If you want to continue these conversations and continue. Where is that going to be? Where is it on? This is going to be, I didn't put that on here. <laughs> um, it's going to be in Greenville, South Carolina. You can fly into that little airport there. It's a 20 minute ride. It's a beautiful little city. Inexpensive, too, really. Thank you guys very much. If you have any other questions, 